this thing on because it's getting ready to be on. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bell Ringer. My name is Greg. Your guest name today is Dr. Nancy Nielsen from the University of Buffalo. She's also past president of the American Medical Association. We talk about her career in infectious disease, how we're handling coronavirus here locally, our heroic healthcare workers, and then more generally about Buffalo as a hub for health and life sciences. Thank you so much to Dr. Nielsen for her time and for her dedication to our community in these difficult times and beyond this crisis. Thank you to all the heroes and our thoughts are with everyone affected. And then thank you to you, the listeners, for your time and, and for giving us a listen. Stay home, stay safe, and we'll get through this together. Thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. How are, how are you holding up through all this? Just fine, actually. Um, getting used to working remotely, although it's a little hard not to see people, but seeing them virtually by Zoom seems to work pretty well. Yes, it's quite different. So we'll dive right in. Um, obviously, the COVID situation is so volatile. It's, it's changing constantly. Uh, where we are today, um, how are we doing locally in flattening the curve? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that uh, as of this morning, 162 people have died in our county and uh, more in the Western New York region. So, so there's a tragic loss of life that has occurred here that we're really grappling to understand. However, it appears that things may be uh, slightly flattening. I don't think we're on the downslope yet because we're still having an increase in cases and hospital admissions. And until that begins to abate, we're just not going to see what New York City apparently is seeing, which is coming down the other side of, of, the, of the curve. Right. And I'm sure to many this point is belabored, but I think it's important to reinforce what do we all need to do to help get us on that trajectory on the way back down? Well, there's really no question about what we need to do. It, it's really clear and, and the, I, I would say the three best spokespersons um, outside of our region are Governor Cuomo um, and, and two physicians on the White House task force, Dr. Tony Fauci and Dr. Deborah Burks. Locally, uh, we have the county executive and Dr. Gail Burstein. All of these are really credible people who are not manipulating data and are telling us that what we have to do is simply stay at home, if at all possible. And, and they're doing everything to encourage that, and the governor and the county executive are, are trying to reinforce that. And I really hope people listen to that. It is frustrating to be at home. Everyone understands that. Everybody would like to get back to things the way they were. But if we do that, we're going to see a surge in this disease locally, and, and that would be a terrible, terrible mistake. Right. Uh, so early in your career, you worked in infectious disease with Buffalo Medical Group. Um, since that time, we've seen several threats crop up. Uh, what makes coronavirus different than HIV or swine flu or some of those other threats we've seen um, over the last couple decades? Well, it's funny that you bring up HIV. I have to say that in my own career, uh, it's been bookended by HIV and by this current coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, the HIV, uh, I, I still remember that first report that came out in June of 1981. I was a young attending uh, at Buffalo General. I was at the Buffalo Medical Group and I had an infectious disease practice. And I remember uh, diagnosing the very first case of HIV in Western New York. And then it was a death sentence, there's no question. And so fast forward um, 30 years, I was on loan to the federal government sitting in the HHS building when Tony Fauci uh, was on stage 
because there was a celebration of the fact that what was a death sentence in the early days is now a perfectly manageable chronic disease. And I sat in the audience and I remembered those first patients that I had seen. And I have to tell you, tears, tears ran down my cheeks because you really realize the impact of, of science and how many lives have been saved. So that was early in my career. Now, much later in my career, and by the way, I've known Tony ever since he started at NIH, um, and whoever knew that he would become um, the rock star uh, that, he, that he is today. Right. But he, he is a great guy, by the way. Um, at, at any rate, now we have this, this disorder that is really very different. It's transmitted differently. But boy, are you seeing scientists, private companies, government, clinicians, the populace, everybody coming together to try to figure out what we're going to do that's going to impact the deadliness of this disease. And in a, in a disease like this, somewhat similar to flu, but deadlier, is you have two phases. You have first containment. And I think what we have to remember is this is a disease none of us have seen before. None of us are immune. So everybody is equally susceptible. But susceptibility is different from exposure. Who gets exposed? Well, you know, healthcare workers, we all know about that, and I celebrate the heroism of those people. But think about the other people who get exposed, the people who, who drive the buses, the people who, who clean the floors, the people who staff the restaurants where we're still making takeout. Many of these are people who cannot work from home, and so they have much more exposure. So what we're seeing and what we're terribly concerned about is the unequal impact in the African-American community across this country. We think it's because of exposure. We think it's also due to some underlying comorbidities, but we really don't know. There's a lot we need to learn. We also need to learn how widespread it is. And in Buffalo, we just simply haven't done enough testing to know that in any of our populations. Right. And I know, I think it was yesterday, those essential workers that you mentioned that aren't able to work from home, I believe are now um, at least more eligible to get tested if, if they're showing symptoms, right? That's important, but it's important to say if they're showing symptoms. Right. We still don't have the testing capabilities to do the random tests. Although actually yesterday, the state health department sent workers to several supermarkets who did random testing of people. And I believe what they were doing was the antibody testing. So that's not a test for the virus. It's a test to see if you have had the virus in the past. Okay. So let's transition and talk a bit about what we are doing locally along those lines. I saw a video that you and the university had put out uh, mentioning partnerships of the institutions locally. Can you talk a bit about who those universe or those institutions are that are partnering and, and what they're working on? Sure. I think this, this is a time when I'm really so happy to, to be in Buffalo where collaboration is, is the rule frankly, um, not always, obviously, but most of the time uh, we, can, we can collaborate to try to accomplish good things. And you are seeing extraordinary collaboration right now. One example is when we just didn't have enough testing. And the reason we didn't is we either didn't have swabs to take the tests or we didn't have the personal protective equipment to protect those who were obtaining them or we didn't have the reagents to run the test or the instrument to run the test on. And so what you saw was a collaboration between basic science labs at, at the medical school where they had components of the reagents, 
nobody had them mixed, but you know, we got the components from different labs, mixed them, and all of a sudden now you have reagents. We had an instrument that was in one laboratory and was used for something completely different. That was, was essentially conscripted and, and given to the Kaleida labs to, to run the tests. So it's just an amazing collaboration. You're also seeing collaboration with Roswell, for example, where they were the first ones to start accepting convalescent plasma from people who have been diagnosed, definitely diagnosed with COVID-19 and who have recovered. Now Kaleida is also doing those, uh, accepting those plasma donors. And so you have all of that, plus you have collaboration way beyond our local region. If you are to go, if you were to go to Buffalo General or any of the Kaleida hospitals, and I talk about them because that's where my career has been, you would have access, if you are seriously ill with COVID-19, you would have access to at least four experimental therapies. Now think about that. That is really quite remarkable. And that's a collaboration among local researchers, clinicians, and researchers across the country and frankly across the world. Right. You touched on the, the heroism of these healthcare workers. Um, and I, I had listened to an interview of yours previously on the topic talking about um, retired healthcare workers volunteering to help in the crisis. And I think I saw a story about UB med students um, that either hadn't graduated or hadn't finished their residency, uh, kind of jumping in the fight. How, how has that gone locally and, and what kind of interest have you seen and, and how has it, it struck you, I suppose? Well, there's extraordinary volunteerism. And I think anybody in healthcare fields, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, you name it, they're used to running to where fires are, not running away. That's why they do what they do. So just if you think about the number of people who volunteered to go to New York City, it was over 70,000 healthcare professionals. I, I was one of them. Um, it turns out that that need has abated somewhat. When you talk about medical students, it's more complicated. Medical students are students, not employees. And so med, med schools across the country are working very hard to keep their med students out of clinical exposure to this disease until we have some proven therapies uh, because we don't want to put them at risk. They are still students. Now that chafes with medical students because they run to fires. And I will tell you, those who are about to graduate on May 1st cannot wait to get into, into being on the helping side. But it's caused us to do a lot of rethinking about how we, how we teach them, how we help them. How can we do some things either online or virtually or in simulation rather than exposing them right now at the height of this epidemic to uh, patients who might put them at risk, even though they have personal protective equipment. So it's required creativity, and that's a good thing. Uh, we put together a course on COVID-19 that is an elective for our students. Um, I'm going to be helping with that course next week. So it really involves a lot of the things that students have learned over the years, but maybe they're now seeing in practice some of these principles of epidemiology, for example, that seemed maybe a little statistically ho-hum when they learned them as first-year students. Now this is life and death. Right. And to talk about those students, I know the new Jacobs School increased the amount of students that, that UB could take, I think, to around a 180, I have heard. Um, I believe you received over 3,500 applicants in the last year. How is the new Jacobs School um, and, and the advancement of UB as an institution, how has that increased the quality of students that we have here in Buffalo? 
And then the flip side of that is how can we help keep them in Buffalo after that May 1st graduation? Well, it's interesting. We had last year, we had 4,361 applications for 180 spots. Now the 180 is important because for years, I mean, ever since I was a med student, when the earth cooled, uh, we had about 140 to 144 students every year. We increased that to 180. And that was possible only because we had the new med school, we had room for them, uh, and we worked really hard to, to increase our capacity, as did many med schools across the country. And so that's been great. Now, in terms of what we've done with that, 4,300, over 4,300 applications, uh, over half of last year's class, about half actually, was from Western New York. And I checked with the Director of Admissions, Dr. Marshall, yesterday to see how it's looking for this year, this unusual year where we're interviewing people virtually. Uh, She said it looks about the same, like it's going to be about a half from Western New York. So we want the brightest and the best, but we also want people who are from Western New York, who want to stay here, to, who want to give back to the community that, that nurtured them. And so there's a lot of effort to try to make sure that our residencies attract the best and the brightest, and that we make this a warm and welcoming medical community where really phenomenal at scientific advances and discoveries are made. And I think that's, that's pretty clear. Yeah, I, I, that was kind of a perfect transition to my next question is, it is clear to those folks in that industry. Um, you and I were, as we were setting up this interview, emailing about a previous episode of the podcast with Dr. Schweitzberg. Um, obviously he has such an impressive career You previously were the president of the American Medical Association um, and a long and successful career. For those that maybe aren't in this day to day, um, how strong is Buffalo's healthcare and health sciences field and the expertise that we have? I listened to Dr. Schweitzberg's podcast and it was really terrific. He, He gave all kinds of business reasons why Buffalo is the place to be. I'm not the business person, but I can tell you that there is no better care anywhere in the world than you can get in in Buffalo. There is no faster scientific discovery than you're seeing in Buffalo with the number of people and, and the private sector partners that we have. So it's a great place to be. And as Dr. Schweitzberg pointed out, it's a terrific place to live. It's just an easy place to navigate. From a clinical standpoint, I'm very impressed about what Buffalo can do that will help inform the nation. Let me give you an example. For about five years, we've had an African-American task force on health disparities. Uh, I'm privileged to be part of that. Dr. Tim Murphy has been the lead and Dr. Alan Lessie from from UB Medical School. Uh, We have worked with the African-American community, particularly the African-American pastors and other leaders, to try to figure out what we're going to do about health disparities. Fast forward now to COVID-19. We are now in a situation where we can talk about health disparities. We can talk about, we can say, okay, we have social determinants of health, poverty, smoking, obesity, but naming it doesn't change it. So what UB and the task force did is UB started a research institute headed by Dr. Murphy that will address this from a research standpoint. So what we're doing, even as we speak, is drafting a proposal to try to widely test seven zip codes in Buffalo that are heavily African-American to try to see what is the prevalence of the virus, what is the prevalence of the antibodies, and we will get a snapshot 
of, of a community that is at terrible risk of dying. So it's time to stop just saying, okay, these are, these are due to things we can't control and say, let's control what we can and let's name it and let's go after it and try to change it. What about Buffalo do you think allows for that speed and that action? The collaboration, the willingness to collaborate is, is extraordinary. This has been a real learning experience uh, for all of us from, from UB, frankly. Um, and it's been an, a situation where we bring research expertise to trying to tackle a problem. But we've learned from those who've lived the problem, who can say, as a, one of the pastors said, I am sick of burying people too young. And we know that if you're African American and you live in Buffalo, you're gonna you're gonna live sicker and you're gonna die younger. While we're out talking about that, though, Erie County itself is not very healthy. The last time I looked, we ranked about either 56th or 58th out of the 62 counties in New York in terms of how healthy we are. So we really have a problem that affects everybody. And, and, and again, these are issues that are important to recognize, but also it's time to do something. You don't have to be president. You don't have to be governor. You don't have to be mayor. Physicians can have influence. And that's what I tell my medical students. There's a difference between power and influence. And if you have to choose, choose the influence and then go to the people who have often been elected or risen one way or another to positions of power. And you as one physician can influence things far beyond what you imagine. Right. Well, thank you so much. Buffalo is very lucky to have you with us and uh, obviously a, a true hero of this crisis along with so many others. Before I let you go, we have a tradition, we have a couple hard-hitting blizzard round questions that you may have heard during the Dr. Schweitzberg podcast. So if you were a flavor of ice cream, what would you be? Oh, that's awful. I have no idea. I guess I saw this interesting ice cream the other day that is triple flavor. It is natural vanilla, it is bourbon flavored, and it is French vanilla. And I think the ability to move from one to the other seamlessly is an example of what we do in Buffalo. That's one of my favorite answers ever. Um, book or TV show that you'd recommend? Well, right now, the, the, the books to read are, are about the 1918 pandemic of flu. Uh, that, that would be uh, my favorite right now. Text or phone call? What do you mean? What do you prefer to get a text or a phone call? Oh, text. Okay. Uh, bills or sabers? Bills for sure. I grew up in West Virginia. We didn't know anything about hockey, but we knew a heck of a lot about football. They're, they're better right now too. So, <laughs> uh, hiking or skiing? Hiking. And last question, most important, chicken wings, drumstick or flat? Drumsticks, easier to eat. That's a great answer. Thank you so much for your time and, and all you do for Buffalo always, but especially during this crisis. Thanks, Greg. It was a joy to be with you. Bell Ringer is a podcast by Invest Buffalo Niagara, the region's privately funded nonprofit marketing and economic development organization. Please rate this podcast, follow our social media channels, and read our blog at buffaloniagara.org for the best of Buffalo Niagara. Come grow your business with us.